So we started looking at uh, elaborating best practice for guidance on how to design and uh, reform support schemes because the Commission started getting very worried about a number of developments in certain member states or in several member states concerning, uh, on the one hand, overcompensation, so very or too generous support schemes and in, in, inevitably were, were unsustainable. And then secondly, often these were followed then by retroactive or brutal changes which uh, undermined uh, investor um, confidence in, our, in the whole energy sector. Um, we've discussed this already, so I think we can jump quickly uh, forward to the actual guidance. Needless to say here, as you see, as you see that uh, we have clear signs showing that uh, we're not on the blue track anymore, but it looks like from the um, official uh, latest statistic we have, which are 2011, 2011, we are still on track. But the next progress report, which the Commission will do next year, and then the official figures we are supposed to get end of this year, beginning of next year, will probably have a slightly different uh, picture painted after that. And uh, it looks like we're more now on the red dotted line with the current policy measures. As was mentioned before, we have to do something to, to continue being on track. So what's the state intervention package all about? Um, usually the Commission never does one thing by itself, so it tries to bundle a num number of initiatives. And uh, here we put together the package like this. Um, seeing that this is an official Lithuanian presidency um, event, I can use some EU jargon or slang as well, and that's the first one here. This hat, a so-called chapeau communication in Brussels language, which is the actual um, policy paper that the, the, the College of Commissioners adopted last, last Tuesday. And this is accompanied by four uh, staff working documents, two of which on renewables, one on cooperation mechanisms, uh, the other one on support schemes, that's the one I'll focus most on today, and then on capacity mechanisms, and then lastly on, on demand response. So the overall thing here is basically it's all about ensuring that we make the most of the internal market. So while the internal electricity market is not an end in itself, we see it as the key driver, the key instrument to actually achieve our policy goals. Like was mentioned before, the triangle the policy goal of EU energy policy, which is security of supply, sustainability, and um, competitiveness or affordability. So there's a huge uh, road ahead still. Um, 2014 seems pretty ambitious to complete our internal market, but uh, this, this package basically is to, to help achieve that more cost efficiency, efficiently. So focusing in on, on renewable support schemes. We all know that national support schemes are a national competence and in this best practice guidance is not legally binding. It's clearly distinct from the state aid guidelines which the DG competition is revising currently and which will be adopted beginning of, of next year where the support schemes for renewables serve the purpose of driving forward innovation, bringing down costs and ultimately making the renewables uh, cost competitive, so they should be invested ultimately without any support. So therefore, this, with this in mind, we designed, uh, we, we drafted this guidance basically with giving indications how support schemes are supposed to be to, to, to favor this sort of market integration approach. Um, firstly, this is what should be avoided. So looking at the whole reform process, what has happened recently, while reform and change is a good thing per se, and I have another matrix where you have around 180 different support schemes that exist for all sorts of technologies and sectors. Um, change actually means, okay, on one hand, member states are ready to, to, to make things better, but on the other hand, it should be in a way that is inclusive of stakeholders. You should actually concert with industry that has an interest, obviously, and then otherwise you risk uh, losing their, their, their interest or their, 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 their confidence to invest further. So what do, we, what do we think? We think that there should be long-term legal commitments for member states to clearly say when, what is going to happen to the support. Um, there should be regular uh, review periods as well, which should be programmed again. So there should be some sort of credibility through transparency and also involvement of the stakeholders. And of course, then the whole financing of the scheme should be um, pretty much based on the polluter pays principle. So try to avoid to finance your support schemes via the, the public purse, especially now in the current economic crisis. This is just another slide showing different type of uncertainty. Depending on who you ask, you get different um, colors of, all over Europe. But uh, the bottom line is there's change and uncertainty to, to, a, to a some extent. 
So then when we turn to the actual support instrument, the Commission is a strong believer in the market and that support schemes should be more and more market-based. In practice, this means that uh, feed-in tariffs should be phased out as technologies mature and as they're able to be exposed to a certain degree of, of market exposure, market risk. And therefore, feed-in premium schemes in their various forms or quota schemes are a very good tool to use here, and the Commission advocates that this should be, should be done in that way. Um, on top of that, flexible market-based schemes also allow then to um, use the market as a driver for renewables investment at some point. Maybe the emission trading scheme <coughs> might become a, a price driver for renewables investment. Therefore, if you have a market-based scheme that actually takes that into account, then this is the best way to, to then combine the two. But of course, beyond the actual support schemes, you also have to look into the environment in which the, the, the renewables are operating. So looking at the actual market structure, the markets and the, the grids, the networks, everything which we have at the moment, including some of the, the operators and agencies, were designed for traditional base load uh, power production. And that's a challenge because now we have our targets. We want to have more variable or intermittent uh, renewables. Most investment outside the north and the east of and central Europe are PV and, and wind. And therefore, we need a different uh, uh, framework. We need, need a different structure of the market. So if you want to give, for example, variable renewables the same balancing obligations as traditional fossil fuel-based uh, load have, we have to change the rules. Otherwise, it's just simply not fair and it's also not cost efficient for the, the overall uh, electricity system. We're also looking at um, the grid connections. And here you see the picture of how, how differentiated it actually looks all, all over Europe. And we're trying to see also what, what can be done about this and to get member states to agree on some sort of convergence here uh, to make sure that the picture is, is similar between different countries. And then of course, in the future, ideally, we want market players and TSOs to look beyond their borders and also do balancing beyond the national borders and use these synergies that you can do uh, across, across the European energy system. Then we have a part in the guidance on, on, on cost control and how to actually calculate uh, the support level. And this is um, a quite a telling graph. I mean, I like it a lot because you, you can see on the one hand uh, the great overcompensation that took place in the German PV uh, sector. You know, the, the difference, the white area between the top blue line and then the, the vertical bars shows how much over, overcompensation actually took place. But at the same time, you see this tremendous cost reduction which happened here between 2006 and 2013. So from 500 euros per megawatt hour down to around 150 today. And that's a success story as well. Nobody really knew that PV was gonna get so cheap. Nobody really knew how fast, when and how. Nobody expected this tremendous innovation, these economies of scale that drive down costs. Maybe the guys in Germany who were building the machines that they exported to China who then produced the PV panels and were imported back then, maybe they knew. But nobody told the policymakers, and that explains to a certain extent why the, the tariff didn't follow as fast as a reduction of the cost. And basically, in the guidance, we are coming up with a number of indications of, uh, of, of how to calculate the, the tariffs and how they should be set, what elements should be looked at, and then what potential there is to harmonize or converge these methodologies and these cost components of, uh, of the support schemes to make them more Europeanized. And this is the the other European slang, Europeanization, I mean, to the, the extreme of Europeanization is obviously one support scheme. We are really looking at it from the current legally possible and pragmatic approach, which is converging the existing national support schemes through integration into the market. And also, of course, using the cooperation mechanisms. That's the other guidance we drew up with, which is cooperation mechanism. The Swedish-Norwegian is actually the only one that exists at the moment. There are many other in embryonic stage, and we've been approached by several member states, mainly those who want to sell. There are still not so many countries who actually want to buy, but it's, it's starting. And, and the idea is basically to make use of the various uh, factor endowments that different countries have. I mean, this is a very crude picture of actually of the situation and then engage member states to, to use one of the three potential uh, cooperation mechanisms that exist already now in today's renewables directive. So the simplest form is a statistical transfer, whereby it's just a bilateral contract between two member states to decide that you produce in country A, country B finances, and in country B simply gets a statistical transfer. So no actual physical flow of electricity. 
And then the other one is a joint project, for example, in the offshore. That's an area where possibly a joint project could be working. And then the Swedish-Norwegian example is a joint support scheme. We looked at why there are barriers there, what are the perceived barriers by member states, and what we can do to help them address these barriers, and how we can actually find a, a practical solution to, to overcome this. We even included some sort of contract models on our internet and, and hope that the member states will make use of them. And now we enter the second phase after the adoption of the guidances, which is a sort of practical implementation of all these elements which are in there. Thank you for your attention.